James Charles is getting sued by his former assistant for wrongful termination, and a jury trial is set for next year. Saucy, saucy. Hello and welcome back to Drama Investigator. So yeah, James's former assistant is him big time and everyone is freaking out online wondering what the heck is going on. As we can see she's helped take photos for James's Instagram, she's edited his videos, she's done it all ladies and gentlemen. She also successfully served Erica Costell in the past because she was in fact Erica's former assistant and apparently she's recently reached a settlement with Erica. Done with the Erica lawsuit onto the James Chihuahua lawsuit. Damn this girl has got to be raking it in. She'd recently tweeted about James. James and Erica. One one, going two for two because I'm all about law and order. Screw enough people over and the universe steps in. Watching the same people who screwed me over massively end up in deep scandals isn't new to me. It's karmic debt. So yeah, going back to the recent lawsuit against James, there's currently a lot of back and forth going on of people defending both James and people defending Kelly, as we can see here. In a recent update, it states that there will in fact be a jury trial set for the 3rd of January 2022. Saucy, saucy. See. And this is a little bit worrisome for James, to be honest, because he's no longer earning a living on YouTube as he got demonetized. He's lost his bread and butter, Morphe, and he's no longer getting sponsorships. He has a house at least though, but unfortunately a Balenciaga bag ain't going to pay the bills in 10 years. Now, before we get into the lawsuit, just want to be open-minded here and not automatically assume everything this Kelly person has said is fact, because as bad of a person as James Chihuahua is, he could very well be innocent for what she has accused him of. Today we're going to view this lawsuit objectively and basically just see what this woman is complaining about and accusing James Chihuahua of. And conversely, it will be juicy to see what James's response is and who wins in court. As we can see, the complaint is for failure to pay all wages, failure to provide minimum wage compensation, <gasps> failure to provide overtime and double time compensation, waiting time penalties, disability discrimination, failure to provide reasonable accommodation, failure to engage in good faith interactive process, retaliation, and wrongful termination. So let's skip right to the statement of facts and see what James Charles is getting accused of. This case presents the compelling story of a hard-working employee who was terminated by Sister Sister in retaliation for her medical condition and her engagement in protected activity in relation to her former employer, Costell Enterprises. On April the 2nd, 2018, Ms. Rocklands began her employment with Sister Sister as a video editor. Throughout the initial period of her employment, Ms. Rocklin was constantly praised for her hard work, dedication, and talent by Mr owner and operator of Sister Sister. On July 9th, 2018, in recognition of her stellar performance, Ms. Rocklin was promoted to producer of Sister Sister. Ms. Rocklin gladly accepted the position. However, after promoting Ms. Rocklin, Sister Sister never hired a replacement editor, which required Ms. Rocklin to perform both roles simultaneously. This required Ms. Rocklin to work upwards of 12 hours per day and seven days a week to meet the ongoing production needs of Sister Sister. Despite performing both roles and working extensive overtime hours as a result, Result, Ms. Rocklin was not provided overtime compensation. Now, I can literally just imagine James saying, So many people would do anything for this job. Everyone would love to work for me no matter what. So you can imagine what Ms. Rocklin had to go through. Ms. Rocklin informed defendants that these grueling hours were unsustainable and requested the editor position be filled. Ms. Rocklin also informed defendants that she was not being paid overtime wages. Throughout her employment with Sister Sister, Ms. Rocklin never received any wages for any of the overtime hours that she worked. In response, Mr. promised that he would repay Ms. Rocklin by providing her a raise in six months' time that would compensate her for the unpaid overtime premiums. Ms. Rocklin's incredibly long working hours began to take a toll on her physical and emotional well-being. She continued to raise these concerns to defendants and implored them to hire a new editor so that she could return to her normal working hours. Nevertheless, a new editor was never hired during Ms. Rocklin's tenure with Sister Sister. On September 4th, 2018, Ms. Rocklin suffered a head injury while in the presence of Ms that resulted in her experiencing headaches, temporary loss of consciousness, confusion, amnesia, dizziness, ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, slurred speech, delayed responses, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, sensitivity to light and noise, sleep disturbances, psychological adjustment problems, anxiety and depression. This in resulted in Ms. Rocklin losing consciousness and being admitted to the emergency room via ambulance. Ms. Rocklin's hospitalisation caused her to miss time at work and caused delays in meeting video production goals. Rather than showing any concern or empathy for Ms. Rocklin's serious medical condition, Mr. 
Kristen callously accused her of not being dedicated to her job as a result of her work being delayed while she was hospitalised. Upon returning to work, Mr Dick and convened a meeting with Ms. Rocklin, wherein he chastised her for falling behind on video production during the period she was tending to a medical condition. Specifically, Mr. Dixon informed Ms. Rocklin that he was disappointed with the fact that production projects were not compelled while Ms. Rocklin was hospitalised. Mr. Dixon went as far as to say, I want to be your friend, but I'm your employer, and the fact that your health was the reason why the video didn't go up doesn't make it a reason for an upload not to take place, or words to similar effect. Concurrent with Mr. Dixon, in-person disregard for Ms. Rockland's medical condition, he would send her text messages stating her health condition was important to him. Ms. Rockland texted Mr. regarding his duplicity, questioning why he appeared considerate of her medical condition in texts, while repeatedly chastising her for missing time during in-person conversations. James responded by denying that the in-person conversation occurred, stating, Messages like this make me question whether or not you are actually 120% invested in the team. On September 11th, 2018, Ms. Rockland was readmitted to the hospital for a fourth time in connection with her head Ms. Rockland's treating physician diagnosed her with a concussion and instructed her to take a week off of work in order to recover. Ms. Rockland informed Ms. of her medical condition and need for leave of absence. Mr. responded by stating he knew Ms. Rockland's close friend was not in town and that she should enjoy her week off with her, implying Ms. Rockland was not being truthful concerning her head and need for accommodations and connection there within. On September the 19th, 2018, immediately upon Ms. Rockland's return from medical leave, Sister Sister callously informed her that she was being terminated due to poor performance. Notably, prior to her medical condition, Sister Sister never took the issue with Ms. Rockland's performance and had instead recently promoted her to producer. In fact, two days prior to her concussion, Mr had showered Ms. Kelly's praise due to her excellent performance. Thus, any perceived performance issues were as a direct result of Ms. Rockland's condition, repeated hospitalisation, and inability to work the gruelling schedule defendants demanded of her during this time period. On May the 21st, 2018, Ms. Rockland made a request for employment files from her prior employer, Costell Enterprises. On June the 20th, 2018, Nixon Peabody responded to the record's request. Coincidentally, Nixon Peabody Specifically, a partner at the firm, Ellie Altshuler, happens to also represent Sister Sister. Ms. Rocklin is informed and believes and based thereon alleges that her termination was subsequently motivated by Sister Sister, becoming aware that she had engaged in protected activity, namely requesting her employment records from Costal Enterprises and her contemplated legal action against the company. This is an action brought by plaintiff against defendants alleging disability and or medical condition discrimination failure to provide reasonable accommodations, failure to engage in good faith interactive process, and retaliation. So here in the first cause of action, it goes in depth about James's failure to pay all wages upon separation. At all relevant times herein, defendants were required to compensate their employees for all hours worked upon reporting for work at the appointed time stated by the employer, pursuant to Industrial Welfare Commission. Furthermore, defendants were required to pay employees all wages upon separation of employment pursuant California Labor Code. Defendants have failed to pay plaintiffs proper minimum wage compensation or overtime compensation for any overtime hours worked. Under the aforementioned wage order and regulations, plaintiff is to recover compensation for all hours worked, but not paid by defendants for the three-year period prior to filing of this action. Defendants' conduct described herein violates Labor Code. Plaintiff is entitled to recover damages for the non-payment of wages, penalties, plus reasonable attorney fees, interest, and costs of suit therein. Second cause of action, failure to provide minimum wage compensation. Defendant and each of them failed to pay the minimum wage to plaintiff for all overtime hours worked during the entire course of her employment with defendants. Plaintiff is therefore entitled to the recovery of such amount, plus interest and penalties thereon, attorney's fees and costs pursuant to labour code, in an amount according to proof at trial. Plaintiff is also entitled to the recovery of liquidated damages pursuant to labour code, as the result of defendant's failure to provide minimum wage in an amount equal to wages unlawfully withheld in attorney's fees and costs pursuant to labour code in an amount according to proof at trial. Here is the third case of action which delves into James's failure to provide overtime and double time compensation. By defendant's policy of requiring non-exempt employees to work in excess of 8 hours in a workday and or 40 hours in a work week without compensation such as employee at the rate of time and one half for overtime hours worked as a alleged above, defendants willfully violated the provisions of labour code. The lawsuit then goes into waiting time penalties and then it discusses disability discrimination 
discrimination. Plaintiff was treated less favourably than similarly situated co-workers with respect to the terms, conditions and privileges of her employment and defendant's policies and procedures were applied differently to plaintiff compared to other persons employed by defendants due to plaintiff's actual or perceived disability. Defendant's discriminatory actions against plaintiff, as alleged herein, constituted unlawful discrimination and employment on accounts of plaintiff's actual or perceived disability. As a direct foreseeable and proximate result of defendant's wrongful acts, plaintiff has suffered and continues to suffer substantial losses of earnings and employment benefits and has suffered humiliation, embarrassment, mental and emotional distress and discomfort or to her damage in an amount proven at trial. Plaintiff is informed and believes and therein alleges that the AFA said acts directed towards her were carried out with a conscious disregard of her right to be free from from such legal behaviour, such as to constitute a prison for or malice pursuant to California Civil Code Section 3294, entitling plaintiff to punitive damages in an amount appropriate to punish and set an example of defendants named herein. Sixth cause of action, failure to provide reasonable accommodations. While plaintiff was employed with defendants, defendants were aware that plaintiff suffered from an actual or perceived disability. Plaintiff informed defendants that she needed reasonable accommodations and the form time off to recover from her injury and conclusion. Although defendants knew of plaintiff's physical disability, defendants refused to accommodate plaintiff's disability upon plaintiff's request and instead terminated plaintiff because of her disability in direct contravention of the FEHA and specifically in violation of California Government Code Section 12940. Plaintiff alleges that she could have fully performed all duties and functions of her job in an adequate, satisfactory and or outstanding manner, particularly if she was provided with reasonable accommodations as requested. As approximately result of the wrongful acts of defendants and each of them, plaintiff has been harmed in that she suffered actual consequential and incidental financial losses, including without limitation loss of income, salary and benefits, and the intangible loss of employee-related opportunities for growth in her field and damage to her professional reputation, all in an amount according to proof at the time of trial. As a direct foreseeable and proximate result of defendants' wrongful acts, Plaintiff has suffered and continues to suffer substantial losses of earnings and employment benefits and has suffered humiliation, embarrassment, mental and emotional distress and discomfort or to her damage in an amount proven at trial. Plaintiff is informed and believes in their own alleges that the AFA said acts directed towards her were carried out with a conscious disregard of her right to be free from such illegal behaviour such as to constitute a person of malice pursuant to California Civil Code Section 3294, entitling plaintiff to punitive damages in an amount appropriate to punish and set an example of defendants named herein. Seventh course of action, failure to engage in good faith interactive process. While plaintiff was employed with defendants, defendants were aware that plaintiff was disabled and required accommodations. In fact, plaintiff requested reasonable accommodations and was terminated upon her return to work. Plaintiff is informed and believes and therein alleges that at no time did defendants engage in any sort of interactive process as required by California Government Code to accommodate plaintiff's known disability and instead terminated her employment for requesting reasonable accommodations. As a proximate result of the wrongful acts of defendants in each of them, plaintiff has been hung in that she has suffered actual consequential and incidental financial losses, including without limitation loss of income, salary and benefits, and the intangible loss of employment-related opportunities for growth in her field and damage to her professional reputation, all in an amount according to proof at the time of trial. Eighth cause of action, retaliation. Thereafter, rather than providing plaintiff with reasonable accommodations, defendants retaliated against plaintiff. The acts of retaliation include, but are not limited to, terminating plaintiff plaintiff's employment upon her return to work from her leave of absence. The foregoing conduct constitutes acts of retaliation performed by defendants in response to plaintiff's conduct and asserting the existence of her disability and requesting reasonable accommodations in connection with the same. Ninth cause of action, retaliation. As alleged above, plaintiff was retaliated against because she requested her employment file from her previous employer, Costell Enterprises. Ms. Outshuler, who represented both Sister Sister and Costell Enterprises, responded to the request. Defendants then retaliated against Ms. Rocklin for exercising her rights under the California Labor Code and wrongfully terminated her employment. As a result of the actions of defendants and each of them as alleged herein, plaintiff is entitled to a civil penalty in the amount of $10,000 for each violation pursuant to Labor Code. Tenth cause of action, wrongful termination. As a direct result of the discriminatory harassment 
Thing and retaliatory acts by defendants, plaintiffs was terminated in direct violation of public policy. Defendants knew or reasonably should have known of the intolerable discriminatory acts and conditions of their impact on and other employees similarly situated and could have remedied the situation. So lastly in the complaint there is a prayer, which basically means that this is what plaintiff Kelly is asking from the judge and hopes to receive as a result of taking James to court. So after reading Kelly's side of the lawsuit, what are your thoughts on this whole situation? Do you think she will win? Let me know in the comments.